Nation's Trust Bank Private Banking is the epitome of elite banking. With its exclusive privileges devoted to providing just the right balance between financial success and lifestyle, our private banking members richly deserve. A financial solution dedicated to excellence. With an unparalleled array of products and services that enrich, enhance and empower success. A financial solution focused on wealth creation, lifestyle and the establishment of legacy. A legacy of priority, a legacy of abundance, a legacy much desired. Creating a legacy that's timeless. Uh, we thank our corporate partners for the lecture series, the Nation Trust Bank, who have been supporting the series for the last six years. In addition to that, they also support us with the printing of the lorries, Warner, and also the Daily Telegraph, uh, the Jungle Telegraph. Uh, the the lorries, the past issues, all scanned and available on uh, the website. So anyone who is interested in catching up on some of the past issues, please try and access them. I know a lot of the students now use it as reference material. Uh, our, the society's 129th annual general meeting would be held on the 27th. So all members, all life members and general members who have paid up their fee as at 2023, uh, please attend that. Uh, it's at 5 p.m. at Hector Corbigadua uh, Auditorium. It's also available on Zoom for members who are joining us from outstation and overseas. So if you have any of your friends who are living overseas or members, please let us know. We'll send them the Zoom link. Unfortunately, it will not be published on any of the public uh, platforms. Uh, this year, we also have, because the, general, uh, the AGM is likely to take a very, very short time because uh, uh, we do not have any uh, elections of sorts, which already predetermined. So uh, the AGM, the post AGM, we're having a, a gathering. So if any of you are interested, please give your name. It's a ticketed event. Uh, so please join us on the 27th. The field trips uh, has gained a lot of uh, popularity. We've been enjoying some luxury outings in the last four or five months. Uh, the calendar has been published uh, on all our platforms. Please do check it out and would like to have uh, some of the young members also joining in. Yeah, uh, we invite non-members, any of you are here, please join the society. Membership forms are available or you could join online. And if you are into writing scientific uh, articles, please contribute to the lorries. Uh, the next issue is being planned at the moment. I was talking to some of the people who just went on the last trip. That might be an interesting contribution as well, Sri, so you can write something about the trip. Uh, Udavalave and Yala bungalows are renovated, uh, and as you know, both of them are in fantastic location. Uh, please do use them. Some exciting things happening around the Yala bungalow. I will not go into details here and cause a traffic jam there. Uh, Follow us on our social media platforms and please join us. Some of the issues that we've been facing in the recent past, uh, most of you would have read it either in the newspapers or followed us in some of our pages. One was the, the crazy idea of trying to export uh, our talk uh, macaques from here. Thanks to, I mean, depth of knowledge uh, through Professor Ditus, we've been able to now go into a legal uh, battle uh, additionally, we have about over 151 global organizations that have pledged their support to fight this and stop it. So as a last resort, we have gone into the legal issues, so hopefully we'll be able to fight it out and stop that uh, madness. Uh, before we get to the lecture, I'd like to call Devika just to give a slight, uh, a very short introduction to one of our initiatives, which is the Wild Kids. Devika, over to you. Thank you. 
Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, uh, Spencer, for the introduction. Uh, Wild Kids is a relatively uh, new subcommittee in the WNPS, and uh, we have gained, gained a great momentum by the activities we have curated for our young members, the very young members, the age group uh, ranging from five to 12. And, uh, well, I would like to have uh, slides. Okay, uh, as you can see, uh, we are partnered with uh, Sela Antikiri. Uh, I will run through the events that we organized last year, uh, keeping to our theme, giving more green time to young minds. So wetland walk uh, was held at the Diasaru uh, Park. That was last year in January, and it was a great kickoff. Uh, teaching the kids the importance of the wetlands uh, and its uh, biodiversity. Next, uh, it was an art competition that we held in Jaffna, uh, hosted by Fox Resort and organized by the Wild Kids. We have this uh, backyard wildlife photography competition annually. We select uh, weekly winners and an overall winner, and it has become a kind of a very popular event in our agenda. Uh, that was followed by a, a photography workshop on do's and don'ts of uh, wildlife photography, which was also kind of a hot topic a week ago. <laughs> uh, online lecture on dinosaur was a, a kind of a favorite uh, online program that we did. It was conducted by a 14 year old girl uh, named Karen Mutaya from USA. <laughs> Next uh, was uh, Leave No Trace, a training on outdoor ethics. It was uh, conducted at the Badagana Wetland Park by Major Ruan Ranathunga and Master Trainer Darshana Ranathunga. An online uh, art workshop was carried out to enhance the creativity of our young members. It was conducted by uh, Priscilla Karen. Not forgetting the entertainment for our kids, we had uh, Auntie Sulochana Disanayaka do a puppet show named uh, Zippy the Zebra. Final event for 2022 was a butterfly study at uh, MJF Center Moratua. It was felicitated by uh, Rajita Gamage. How to be a scientist was the first event for 2023 conducted by Nethu Vikramasinghe and her team teaching the kids to do a scientific observation on nature. Next two events were online on whales and on flamingos. The events that we have planned out for the rest of the year are as follows. Uh, it's an ast astro camp that we're planning to do on Saturday the 20th at the Colombo University, a turtle study in down south, backyard wildlife photography competition again, a birding event, a competition to celebrate uh, Children's Day, a visit to the elephant transit home in Udawalawe, and a butterfly study in the North Central Province. So these are some of the activities that we have done and we have lined out for the rest of the year for wild kids. Thank you for your time. May I call upon Professor Sampath to introduce our guest speaker today. Uh, before we do that, uh, just a small correction about the gathering after the AGM. It's not ticketed, but you're open to make a donation of either 1,000 or 1,500 rupees and be there. Thank you. Thank you, Spencer. Uh, so I'll have the honor of uh, introducing uh, today's speaker. Uh, today's speaker is uh, a very special person, a slightly different uh, speaker in the uh, wildlife, uh, you know, fraternity. But it's a very important, I think, component uh, that she's going to cover. So we have Professor Taranga Thoradeniya uh, today. She's a, 
uh, professor at the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at the Faculty of uh, Medicine, uh, University of Colombo. Uh, professor Torzini has had her Bachelor of Veterinary Sciences degree from the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine and Animal Sciences, uh, the vet faculty that normal people would know, uh, from Peradenia. And uh, she's a Commonwealth, and she has a PhD in uh, uh, Nutritional Biochemistry from the University of Colombo. Uh, Dr. Storodenia, now professor, is a Commonwealth Academic Fellow and a, and a CEDA accredited teacher uh, and with uh, years of experience in teaching. Uh, professor Storodenia has broad research interest and experience in metabolism and functionality of micronutrients, nutritional modulation of chronic disease risks, food systems, animal welfare and ethics, as well as alternatives and planetary health. Kind of bit of a <laughs> bit of a mouthful. Anyway, and uh, her veterinary background, uh, specialty in the nutrition and exper experience in medical field, place her in a better position to uh, to utilize her knowledge and experience in a multi and transdisciplinary approaches in her research and teaching. I think that's why she's here uh, today. And. Uh, uh, she, she had received many awards and honors for excellence in research, including the President's Award for Scientific Research, Nas National uh, Consultative Award, and International Atomic Ener Energy Authority uh, Award. She was the first South Asian scientist to, uh, be the, uh, to be awarded the prestigious Global Animal Welfare Award by the World Veterinary Association and Seva Sante Animale into 2020 for her outstanding service and dedication in promoting animal welfare in res an 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 animal research. Uh, this is the uh, research uh, animals, uh, laboratory animals. She has extended her expertise to national programs by serving as an expert in subcommittees on nutrition communication at the Ministry of Health. Also, Professor Tordini is a vibrant advocate for science, particularly for young scientists and women in science. She extends her passion in science promotion through numerous professional associations as well. She's a past president of the Sri Lanka Academy of Young Scientists when she was young, and the Sri Lankan Association for Laboratory Animal uh, Sciences. Uh, besides this long list, she had a huge, a long CV, I kind of somehow managed to uh, that get it into a one page. Uh, she's a very exciting uh, person, very, very uh, vocal and uh, uh, enthusiastic individual, uh, a very good colleague. Uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have Wit talking about animal welfare today. Thank you. Thank you, Sampath, for those kind words. Good evening, everyone. It's great to be here. Thank you, WNPS, for your invitation. Wildlife, is it truly wild? I'll be introducing three concepts to you today during my talk. Number one is animal welfare. We love animals, and we think they love us but we do not feel enough for them. Number two, Anthropocene, wildlife is not truly wild in this present time, known as Anthropocene. Number three, planetary health, a solution through a novel planetary health approach and a paradigm shift. Animal welfare. If I ask what this animal is, you would tell me that it is a lab rat. I will tell you that it's a wild animal. Yes, a lab rat has been wild 100 years ago. We have selectively bred them to become lab rats, so they contribute to advancement of sciences. There's an interesting a video produced by a scientist from University of Oxford known as Rat Life. I wish I could show that to you. Due to limited time, I will take you through this video. 
So these lab animals bred 100 years ago uh, in labs, that's like 200 generations, have never seen outside. They were released to the wild. Being inquisitive animals, they came out of the cages, they explored. And within a day, they showed their natural behavior. They're, they ate wild berries. They have never tasted wild berries. You know what they're uh, fed on in the lab. But they have that natural instinct. We all have that. We all have that instinct to identify the food that is suitable for us, which we have grown out of it, I'm, I'm afraid, unfortunately. But all animals have that instinct. And if some animal eats something and then if they feel uncomfortable or uneasy, the other animals will not try eating that. So that is the behavior they have. And then a uh, intruder came in, that's a cat, you know. So what happens when a rat sees a cat? They have never seen cats or smell cats or heard cats when they were in the lab. But the natural instinct, the rat is a prey animal. So it, when they heard the sound, when they sensed the cat, they all ran away. Not all these lab rats, there were about 50 of them, saw this cat, but they all hid. They have the natural behavior of burrowing soil, but they have never burrowed soil in the lab. But they did manage to do that in the wild because they had that wildness within them. So they hid and came out only they felt when they felt that the threat has gone away. So this award-winning video led to change how scientists saw animals and how they treated animals when they do experiments and also how they looked at animal welfare and behavior and really thought about the feelings of the animal. I would ask you now, do you think these animals feel Just think about all these animals in the picture. There's a rat, a puppy, a guinea pig, a leopard, a mosquito, a giant elephant, a dolphin, a zebrafish that we use for laboratory experiments, and lobsters. What do you feel? Just think about it. Do they have emotions? Do you think they have emotions? What made you to think that they feel? What made you to think that they have emotions? Your own instincts, right? Some of you may know by learning about these animals, by, ex by experimenting on these animals, by researching on these animals, like my friends, colleagues here. Some of them may have used your own instinct if you feel pain, if you feel love, if you feel emotions, then these animals also might be feeling that. A good example is the puppy that we have, or our pets. We know that they feel love, emotions, and experiments have shown that. Owners have left dogs in a room where there was food, but the owner told the dogs not to eat the food. When the owner came back, some of the dogs have eaten the food. Some of them have not. And when parameters were assessed to see what the dogs have been feeling, they showed guilt. The parameters reflecting guilt were seen in these dogs. So they were feeling guilty for eating the feed, food that was prohibited. Experiments have been done in all these animals to identify with this if uh, they feel emotions and feelings and the lobster for example is known to have a very complex nervous system and how they think about hierarchy is similar to how we think about hierarchy but what do we do with them we eat them animals do feel pain these experimental rats as soon as they hear the meow meow what happens to the relaxed 
animal who's chilled, whose parameters are normal. The animal, when normal, has normal heart rate, normal breathing rate, normal temperature, everything in the animal is normal. But as soon as they hear a threat or a challenge, this cat, what happens? They startle. What happened to their heart rate that increases? Their temperature increases, they get ready to flight or fight. What do the animals do? As shown in that video, they run away. But if they do not have the opportunity to do that, what happened to them? If they're caged, what happened to them? They can become stressed. All their parameters change, the physiological parameters change. What happened at cellular level? There'll be release of chemicals, getting them ready to this challenge. If they're caged, this stress become, if they don't have the opportunity to express what they want to do, their stress becomes distress. And not only the systems that allows them to run away will activate, but other systems like the immune system and the GI system, everything will be affected. Some of you may recall how you went to the toilet several times when you're getting ready for an exam. That is because of your stress, getting into distress, affecting your gut system. So similar things happen to animals as well. So animal welfare is what is good for the animal, not what is good for us, not what is good for you or me. It is what is good for the animal. And we have three main areas when you talk about animal welfare. That is the basic health. That is the physical thing about animal, whether the physiology, whether their growth is normal, whether they reproduce normally, the physical aspect. And the natural living system, whether they live the way the animal want in the natural environment. But we often forget the affective state. That is equally important about feelings and emotions of the animals. Pleasure, happiness, pain, distress, suffering, they all do feel that. So the best thing in when assessing welfare is to assess all of these things together to see whether their welfare mean, needs are met. So this happens in all animals. This picture may not be very clear to you, but it shows that the long, very common cues in national parks, and there's a leopard trying to approach or trying to uh, approach the vehicles that are queued. What do you think this animal is feeling? What do we feel? We like it because we can take pictures, we can see the animal close to us. It's good for us sometimes. But what is good for us may not be good for the animal. Do you think that the animal's heart rate is changing? The animal's emotions are changing? Sometimes, now we say that what is good for us is not good for animals all the time, but that is a good way to start off thinking about how animals feel. What we feel, we can relate to what animals feel. A nice picture, a cub is playing with the mum. That's their wild behavior, natural behavior. The next moment, the cub spots that somebody is watching. Related to you playing with your kid, do you think your kid will like if somebody is watching them all the time when they're playing? Do you like it? This mom and um, the baby is, the baby is enjoying a meal. Hey, mom, why are you stopping and looking away? I want to enjoy the meal, the baby asked. Wait, I sense some danger, let me check on it. So this is how everybody, all animals, including us too, we want to stay alive, we want to keep our babies alive, and let the life continue. Do you think this tape is too close to the animal? What happens if somebody follows us all the time? We don't really like it, right? But do you think about the expression of this animal? 
magnificent, magnificent, beautiful. It's calm. Yeah. What about this animal? It's not calm, it's alert. What about this animal? Feeling quite depressed for a king, right? So this animal was sedated in a zoo in Indonesia for us to take selfies. When we focus on animal welfare, I would say that there's no set framework for animal welfare. There have been different frameworks proposed. And we generally go by a few principles. I would like to say that these are common ones that we can focus on when we talk about animal welfare. We can see whether they are feeling hungry. Are they hungry? Are they thirsty? These are basic needs. Are they in discomfort? Are they at risk of pain, injury, or disease? Can they express their natural or the wild behavior? Are they in fear or distress? And when we do interventions to protect animals, we can have this as a key formula. Did the animal suffer? Let's say, for example, you want to do captive breeding to protect a species that is near extinct. You have to do interventions. Ask, did the animal suffer? Was the suffering necessary? And would a reasonably competent humane conservationist or in science, scientist or in person tolerate this suffering? So this might be a formula for us to use on. Unless we focus, we miss this. How do we know that animal welfare needs are met and that they are truly happy? We say that if you do not do experiments in happy animals or animals that the welfare needs have been met, your experiments do not succeed. So how do you know, how do we assess animal welfare? There are many ways to assess animal welfare and most are numerical measures. We can assess their physical parameters, their blood pressure, temperature, et cetera, and their behavioral features and qualities of the environment that the animal live in. And a best example for assessment, whether, assess whether the animal is happy is, take an example from your pet. How do you see or how do you judge that your pet is happy? So we have different methods to assess welfare and to see whether the animals are in pain when we do experiments in the laboratory. So this is one example, a rat. Now there are biological differences. We know that different species are different. When we are in pain and when, for example, a dog in, is in pain, they vocalize. Now, if a rat is in pain, do you think it will shout? No, because they are prey animals. They don't want their predators to locate them, especially when they are immobile, immobile, when they can't move. So they do not shout, they do not vocalize, but they express that pain in different ways. So their eyes might be smaller and smaller depending on the degree of pain. So there are different ways that we can see whether these animals feel pain or whether they are in discomfort, depending on their species behavior, biological behavior. So how and why we should assess animal welfare? Why is because that will provide objective unbiased information and seek opportunities for improvement. So unless you know that they're happy, you will not know how to improve their happiness or their naturalness or their wildness. So the best way is again to look at the center, to look at how their physiology or the, how their physical body is, the environment that they live in and how their mind works. So it's center that we should focus when we are assessing welfare. The so best question that you can ask is, what can the animal do? Like, if they have the right opportunity, how many times, or like, how would a leopard have a bath? How would they uh, walk around? Likewise, what they can do. 
The next, I will briefly tell you about the Anthropocene and that we are at threat of extinction because of human action. We know that there have been big five mass extinctions in the Earth's history. One, two, three, four, five. And we are at the edge of the sixth. That's what the scientists say. That is because of human actions. So this is a clouded picture. International Union for Conservation of Nature has produced this based on the evaluation of species. They have identified who are at threat of extinction. The focus on the red and the uh, black color, each symbol resembles 100 species, right? So the red ones are the ones at threat of extinction. They will go away very soon. The black ones are not a threat. And this evaluation is based on the species that have been studied. There may be millions, maybe tens of million species that have not been studied at risk of extinction. To talk about these threats, scientists have de developed a framework known as planetary boundaries in this era. So this diagram shows the planetary boundaries. There are nine planetary boundaries. You can see the center is green, and that is the Holocene. That is where the human impact did not exceed the planetary boundaries, did not have any threat. The human development within that green circle did not have much threat to our survival. But now we have exceeded that. We have exceeded the planetary boundary. You can see from the center, the risk is increasing. And we talk about climate change and ozone depletion, land system change, freshwater use, altered nitrogen and phosphorus flows coming from fertilizers, for example, ocean acidification, atmosphere aerosol loading, the uh, air pollution, and novel entities that is coming from chemicals. It was not quantified, but in 2022, it was quantified and noted that it has fast exceeded the planetary boundary. And then we have this loss of biodiversity. That's what we are talking about, wildlife, biodiversity. So five out of nine planetary boundaries have crossed the limit. That is because of human activity. And all these are linked to each other. The climate change is linked to biodiversity and uh, water availability, uh, the chemical use, all these are linked. It's like a cobweb, as you can see. One is dependent on the other. And the biodiversity and the extinct, extinction of species is also linked to this, because we know that for an ecosystem to sustain, all species are interlinked, they're related. So if one dot is one species, if that goes away, what happened to the links? They start breaking, they start falling apart. So that is how the biodiversity is being lost and how everything is being destroyed. I've listed a few factors that threatens wildlife. Human settlement expansion, we all know, restricting mobility of animals and triggering conflict between humans and animals, plastics and waste, domestication, animal husbandry. There may be more animals in uh, red for human use than all the species of wildlife. Climate change, we all know about it, and the impact of the climate change, pollution, and its impact, for example, on fertility rates of animals, stress from many other human activities, and killing, for example, like trains, vehicles, and then uh, as a source of meat, or any other thing we like to take the task is why can't tasks why can't they wait till the animal dies to take the tasks look at these animals do you think they're hungry human settlement expansion has led to destroying the habitats and they lack food 
So yes, they are hungry. What about these animals? What can you say about the body condition score of these animals? Do they look hungry? Yes, they have been hungry and that's why they're there. This is a junkyard where we dump our waste. And you may see more animals than in Udavala in these junkyards these days. These are our wild elephants. They're eating the junk. So in the waste, you know that there are lots of junk, the plastics, and even uh, animal waste, things, are, things that are coming from slaughterhouses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these animals are in the wild. They eat there and then go to the wild. And you know, roughly an elephant would pass about 100 kilograms of dung a day, and that's like tons during a lifetime. So you see these uh, dung accumulating in the wild. So this is a picture from the wild. You can see polythene in the dung, right? So we know that polythene and plastics do not degrade and they can create microplastics. So what is the threat about microplastics? They're micro, right? We know that the dung is a good ecosystem a micro ecosystem where other small creatures live and those ecosystems that, uh, support other ecosystems and they help each other. What happens if microplastics are accumulating in this town? What will happen to those creatures? There's ample evidence to say that microplastics enter the soil system, enter uh, the food chain and goes into oceans, kill animals, and it again enter to us through fish and the food chain and through the ocean it enters the aerosols so it's in the air so it's everywhere and there have been measures there have been research done to show that these microplastics or even nanoplastics are in our tissues even in the brain even in the fetus and we do not know the consequences yet but it's caring and what other threats that it might have? We know in 1990s, there was a disease called mad cow disease in UK. Why was it called mad cow disease? Because they, the cows started behaving mad because it affected their nervous system. These were animals, uh, livestock animals. They are herbivores. They do not eat animals, but they were fed animals by humans. So they were fed on offals coming from small ruminants like goats, and they had an abnormal protein in them known as scapes prion. So the prion protein is in our brains, in normal brains. It helps various functions, neurological functions in us and in animals. So this abnormal protein did not get destroyed by heat. So it enters these cows, it enters their brain, and this particular protein had a particular structure. Normal protein has alpha helix, it's a normal structure, but this abnormal protein has a beta pleated structure, which when it goes to the brain, when it uh, is in contact with the normal prions, it changes the structure of all the prions to abnormal structure. So there's no normal protein now, so the normal function is lost, that got them diseased. And when humans ate these animals, they also got it, known as Crucifer Jacob disease. So these elephants that I showed you are eating junk. We don't know what they're eating. They must be eating meat, parts of meat from animals. So do we know what will happen? We don't know what will happen. But we have cases from history that has happened, which is scary. This is our natural evolution, right? So we, we had been hunter gatherers, we had not been eating junk all these years, but it has changed, our behavior has changed. We have a domesticated diet now leading to the obesity pandemic. And 
through evaluation, uh, evaluation, uh, evolution. So, uh, like our brain started thinking. Now, if we are if we are hungry or if we are in famine, we start thinking, or our brains prefer high calorie diets as a survival mechanism. But with the food industry creating more tastier food, our brains crave for that. When it's high in fat, trans fat, when it's high in sugar, fructose, and when it's high in salt, that's a craving or MSG, it's a craving for us. So we like to eat more of them. What is this? This macaque grabbed this frizzy drink from my colleague's bag and opened it, started drinking it. Who taught it that? They also crave for tasty stuff, right? A natural instinct. And this is known as Uncle Fatty from Thailand. So can it lead to another pandemic in animals? Like it changed us. We need a solution. We need an urgent solution. And that might be from a new approach. So we'll see how this planetary health approach might help. When we talked about health, we focused on diseases, individuals. And then move, we move on to public health. We talk about health of the communities. We try to prevent diseases, not only cure diseases when uh, we are sick. But we realized that that is also not enough because within hours from one country, somebody can come here or go to another country and spread diseases. So we talked about global health. And it's not enough to talk about human health because we know that we get diseases from animals as well and animals also get diseases from us. So we talked about one health, health of the animals, health of the planet, and then health of the plants, health of the humans and the plants. But then we realize that we are exceeding the planetary boundaries. So we cannot forget the entire planet. So we have to consider about the health of the entire planet if we want to be healthy. So when we talk about the definitions of planetary health, probably because it's uh, the planet is destroying mainly because of human actions, the definitions are also anthropocentric, like human-centered. We say we have to think about the planet and the survival of all systems within the planet for the survival of human beings or humanity. What about the other animals? So we expanded that definition to other animals and we want to see how this approach can help and can protect all living beings and all living and non-living systems. So I will discuss a few interventions. Of course, laws and regulations are very important, as was discussed by the last uh, talk. And public awareness is very important. We have to also educate, make the younger generations aware about the threats, educate them by or uh, through school and undergraduate education or changing the curricula. Civil society community action is very important and maybe a paradigm shift is possible. Some of you may know the story about white-backed watchers in India. In 1990s, they were like nearly disappearing. 99.9% .9 of them started disappearing. Why? Because of human action. Scientists discovered that it is because of misuse of diclofenac. So diclofenac has been misused by the farmers to treat, or it's a painkiller. They gave it to their cattle, especially when they're close to their death. And these watchers fed on the carcasses of these cattle. And this is a potent toxicant. So it ruined their kidneys. It damaged the kidneys of the watchers and they died. And the Indian government in 2018 banned the use and production of diclofenac to save the vultures. It helped with a lot of interventions. They could reestablish this population, but the problem did not go away because people started producing this drug 
although it's bad, they produced it and they still used it. So the scientists proposed that a different approach involving all stakeholders is necessary for vulture conservation. Pharmaceutical industry uh, talking and thinking of doing actual uh, correct production of pharmaceuticals, veterinarians uh, involved in correct use and educating the public and making people aware about the incorrect use and the scientists involved in similar ways and the community should be aware about the problems that happens when they misuse. They can't use pharmaceuticals, they can't use drugs. So if they misuse, what will happen? And of course, the governments have a major role to play in bringing up the regulations, rules, and making sure that they're implemented. But it's not a one-way thing, it's a maze. Everything is linked together. So one cannot work alone. Everybody has to work together. Will this be the Sri Lankan elephant very soon? No, we have to act fast. And again, a solution might be in the small steps that we are taking together. There's a huge problem of increasing waste. What's the reason for that? So this is a diagram that we developed for one of our publications. And we know that the diet has changed in our population. There's urbanization and population pressure. Uh, there's unplanned urbanization coming in and industries coming up. So all this is contributing to collecting waste. And there's no proper waste management. Although there are systems, they are not functioning properly. And people are not really aware about overconsumption. When you go and buy something, do you think twice? When you go to a restaurant, and drink your fridge juice or a juice using a straw, a plastic straw. Do you think twice about using the plastic straw? Do you say no to that? Do you carry water in a mug? Or do you use single-use plastic bottles when you're thirsty? So we have to think small and start small and think about the waste that we are collecting every day. And all this is linked to biodiversity loss. So if we are to protect the elephants from eating the waste and the plastics, we all have to work together. And that picture was from Amparo, and there's a very uh, good waste management plant there, which is not functioning optimally, which is not functioning at all, perhaps. So there are systems, but we have to work together to use them, and we can start individu as individuals. Laws and regulations are important. Why is this bear saying hello to these people in the ship? It's asking for food, and who has given food to the bear? But why? Again, rules and regulations we have to implement. And a paradigm shift might be possible. So we have done some work using different uh, methodology to change people and to introduce some concepts into the curriculum and change things that we do during our day-to-day -day activities and have tried to identify how perception of researchers or individuals might change with the interventions. So. We do training to introduce or like train people, researchers on animal welfare within the country and within the region. And we see that there is a change and people do accept that they have to think about welfare of the animals. And this training is like snowballing. When we go and do a training in an institution, the participants go and do the training in their own institution. So it's spreading which is a good thing. And the training involves the participant themselves. So they start thinking about them. They become the champion. They find the solutions for the problems that they have related to animal welfare. So it's their own thing. And 
We have some collaborative initiatives with professional associations. Sri Lanka Medical Association and Sri Lanka Veterinary Association did the first ever collaborative uh, webinar on One Health, which was during the right time during the pandemic. And then uh, Columbia Medical Congress, we started uh, introducing planetary health, the planetary diet, and World Health Day introduced the planetary health concepts. So at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, we have started introducing these concepts into the medical curriculum, animal welfare, one welfare and ethics. If you are good to animals, you are at, best, at your best with human beings. And we introduce sustainable consumption and production to the first year students. Because when they pass out as doctors, they have to be conscious about overconsumption, how they use the antibiotics and how they use other products to treat their uh, patients, how they use the disposable gloves or anything related to plastics or uh, uh, polythene. And as responsible citizens, they have to be conscious about what they do. So students work on case scenarios and they come up with solutions and they do role plays, uh, TikToks, videos, dramas, etc. Uh, during last year's CMC or 2020 Columbia Medical Congress, we did a hackathon called Rescue Mission Planet Earth uh, on plastic and we invited all 10 faculties from 10 disciplines and they came together and worked on a similar theme all their heads uh, trying to address one issue and they came up with nice solutions and we said no to plastic water bottles introduced the glass water bottle and all the decors were recyclable and plant-based and no food waste was there in the Congress that we held because we gave a packed lunch, which is healthy. We looked at the perception of people and on top uh, chart, you can see the perception of researchers outside Sri Lanka. We asked them about what they feel about the animal use, whether they think uh, this particular animal use is always justified or never justified or sometimes justified. Uh, the Orange is when it's always justified, and green is when they say it's never justified, and uh, yellow is when they say it's sometimes justified. And the bottom left, left my left, uh, shows the researchers from Sri Lanka, what they think about these animal use, and the uh, right side graph shows what the undergraduate medical students think of the animal use. So I'll focus on one thing that is animal use in research. So outside Sri Lanka, about 50% think that it's always justified to use animals in research. In Sri Lanka, the researchers think about like 10%, over 10% researchers think it's always justified because they are already in it. But the undergraduates who are not exposed to that yet think it's not justified or never justified at all. So that might be the window of opportunity for change Right? When you're really into it, it's difficult for you to change. But if you're not in it, maybe you can change them. So we produced some papers and the concepts were uh, incorporated into UNEP uh, Global Dialogue, where we discuss about waste management and how these approaches can be used. So some of these uh, uh, concepts or papers are being used to teach uh, students, university students in different disciplines. So we have a planetary health network at the University of Colombo Faculty of Medicine. And I invite you to join that and think about the change. How many of you know that the powders, the creams, the lipsticks that you wear are tested on animals? Have you thought about it when you purchase it? These countries in the world, it's a handful of countries. You can see India and Norway, UK, Switzerland, Turkey, and some parts of America, 
and South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, they have banned cosmetics tested on animals. But Sri Lanka, we are nowhere. We have not thought about it. But why? I would like to see this picture changed when it comes to animal welfare and ethics in wildlife. So the way forward, laws and regulations, yes, we have to implement them. Public awareness and changing the younger generation through education, school education, undergraduate education, so that they become the champions to save the planet. And civil society community action is really crucial, urgent action is necessary. So there is a lot of good inter intentions and positive actions like the monthly talks that you all do and the wonderful other work that you all do through this society. So that is a very good positive thing to start off, but there should be political commitment and multilateral discussions and actions. I thank my planetary health team from the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, and the science collaborators, Prof. Saruj Jaisinger, Dr. Vijay Pal Singh, uh, Prof. Rangi Kahalwathura, and Ranganath Kirindige and Spencer Manuel for the wonderful pictures they have provided. I've taken some of the pictures from the World Wide Web to build up my story. I have no conflict of interest. Thank you. We have time for a few questions and answers. Thank you for that wonderful lecture, but I have two questions. One is, uh, is in Sri Lanka these experiments on animals happening? And the other question is now, they are doing experiments to improve our living style, uh, vaccinations or medicine. So how should, how can we overcome that problem? Yes, um, animal experiments are happening in Sri Lanka as well, but we have a system to um, make sure that the animals do not suffer. Every institution has an ethics review committee where they looked at the proposals, evaluate the proposals, and see whether the suffering that an uh, animal would go through when the experiments are happening is justifiable, whether that pain is reasonable for the human benefit, because we would not have come um, over the pandemic, COVID-19, if vaccines were not produced, perhaps, and animals contributed a lot to that. So your second question, like uh, without animals, how do we do experiments? There's a lot of work going on to uh, look at alternatives to animal experiments. So if there are alternatives, like we have cell models and we have computer-based uh, simulations, so like before moving in, into even cell culture models, you can simulate and see whether it's doable, whether it's justifiable, and then move into cell cultures and then move into animal experiments. If you have enough evidence to show that there is potential to move into animal experiments, that it's beneficial, then only we move on to animal experiments. And there's a lot of work going on uh, to find alternatives for animals. So there are successful stories and uh, it's not, it may not be possible uh, very soon, but it will be possible. Uh, you spoke about uh, uh, emotions and uh, feelings of animals and you put up a slide uh, with a, a whole lot of animals. Uh, now uh, my question is, is those emotions and feelings related to intelligence? You had one, on, uh, one of the photographs was a mosquito and the other one was an elephant. I don't know too much about mosquitoes except that they bite me, but I know a little bit about elephants. Two examples, Rambo on Odawalewe Park and Gamuno 
uh, in the Yala Park. Uh, they have got used to coming and eating from people. Now that's a learned behavior, no doubt. But I feel that there is a certain element of feeling, a mischievousness in that. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yes, uh, it is related to intelligence as well and learned behavior, as you see. And there are species differences. I, I also don't know about the mosquito, right? Uh, but uh, some small animals, yes, they have studied and they have identified that their nervous system is somewhat similar to uh, rel uh, certain emotions or feelings that some other animals express. So there had been studies, there, there are studies going on. Uh, and also within a species, each individual is also different, as you say, as, as we are different. So the animals will also be different. Did I answer you? One more question there. Our government is uh, mulling to export uh, monkeys. What is your opinion regarding that? Yes, I think uh, your society has taken action uh, on that. So um, it's not clear what they are going to do with the animals. And you saw that like monkeys are so much similar to us. They have a lot of emotions and feelings similar to us. So it's not quite correct the way they are going to control the burden that the animals are having on humans. So that's my feeling. It's not a correct action is my feeling, but there's a lot of work going on. I think uh, the prof is here, so is working on it and your association. A solution, by the way, for that. Uh, I, I do not have a solution to suggest. But we have to get together and come up with a solution. And it should come from different areas, as I understand, not only from behavioral scientists or uh, animal lovers. Every, everybody has to get together. I have a comment uh, to follow up on this current discussion about export of monkeys and um, the use of uh, animals in laboratory experiments. The Western countries and European countries and the Chinese, they use up 30 to 40,000 monkeys every year. These monkeys are killed for experimentation, for pharmaceutical and medical and biomedical experimentation. It has gotten so bad that some species, in, I mean, and most of these monkeys have actually come from other Southeast Asian countries, from Thailand, from Cambodia, <coughs> and, and, um, and so forth. Um, it's gotten so bad that these countries have clamped down and are, are preventing the export of their monkeys. Uh, the breeders are based in China and uh, they import monkeys from other countries, Cambodia, Thailand, what so forth. Because they're running short in those countries, they're now targeting Sri Lanka. That is where this, this request for 100,000 monkeys comes from. It's uh, for breeding Sri Lankan monkeys for export to Western and European and other pharmaceutical um, laboratories. And what we can do about it? Well, I suppose we can put a stop to it. Thank you, Prof. Yes, in, in Sri Lanka, actually, uh, um, we have some examples where monkeys have been used uh, for some experiments, for example, malaria research. But then these animals were not killed afterwards. They had been rehabilitated. So uh, it depends on the experiment that you do. Even though they're not only the monkeys, even though the elephants, especially because last uh, couple of weeks, because I was in the pain, I also a lot of my um, so they were spoke about me because I am the person from the presented in the Daily Mail newspaper. So they said that almost now three uh, mahouts already been uh, severe attack by their uh, that uh, elephants. So those elephants actually they are right from the beginning in their penal orphanage. And even though that's the, another particular part, but other one is because even though you know about some countries, especially like in South Asia, like Pakistan, so has a bad reputation about the elephants. But one is was happened. So, but well, luckily, fortunately, because there was one American lady who so was involved and he was saved that the elephant called the carver. 
and the next time is also now that which is very short period of time so on the couple of films which is try to have send it to the same thing so why actually so been especially the about this is one of the nationals of biggest uh, the tourist attraction to Sri Lanka so I take the which is sort of steps for these kind of things I think it was more a statement than a question. Yeah. Any other questions? If not, we can. Thank you. Actually, thank you very much for your 